And why it is happening? Well, uh, it, it happens on both sides, but uh, it, we need to understand the general context, which would be that the <coughs> references to great patriotic war in Russia helps to mobilize the people, that this uh, memory of the Second World War and this uh, huge effort of the Soviet Union is still remembered and, um, and can really impact the behavior of the people. And also, to re the references to the Great Patriotic War, this was the war against Nazis, against fascists. So if the question of denazification appears and uh, uh, naming um, Ukrainians as Nazis, it's an uh, automatic uh, reference to the World War II. Uh, we also need to remember that after the Second World War, um, uh, World War II, um, in the, um, in the Soviet courts, and by Soviet courts, I, not, I don't mean only USSR courts, but also those courts which were controlled by Soviets in the countries like Poland, like uh, Czechia, or, um, or in the parts of USSR, of course. Um, they, um, the, uh, on the request of the Soviet Union, not only the Nazi criminals were prosecuted, but also the independence underground. Um, and those independence underground, like for example the hidden army in Poland, uh, was named as Nazis. Yeah, that these were that, that they were collaborators, that they, uh, or just directly named uh, uh, Nazis. Um, of course, um, when we talk about World War II, uh, in the um, in reference to Holocaust, the genocide label appears. And what is interesting, as you remember, in the Nuremberg trial, Holocaust was not officially named as genocide in the judgment. However, it was named in this way in national courts, including, for example, um, Poland or Soviet Union. And one more also thing, um, because these references to the Second World War, we could also uh, observe in the assessment of the situation by Ukraine or by Poland and the reluctance to be named as occupying power and to call Russia as occupant, as occupation power. Why it is so important? Because if you, if during the World War II you were a few years under the occupation, under the severe occupation, and this occupation is related with uh, tremendous crimes, to mention that now there is another occupation, now by Russia, this automatically opens in the minds of the people, um, you know, this shelf with the label, oh, so definitely the crimes are committed. So another example, maybe just um, before the, um, uh, the war in Ukraine, for example, in 2003, when the United States started the invasion against Iraq, to which Poland also joined, Poland and also other states, they emphasized and they asked the US to not be named as occupying power, even if they were, according to the international humanitarian law, because they were controlling parts of Iraq, but officially in the Security Council resolutions, occupying power, this was US and UK, others were not named in this way officially, even if according to the law, they were occupying powers. But the explanation, for example, of Polish government was that we would not be able to explain to our public opinion that now we are those good guys, but we are occupying somebody else's territory. So that's why for me it's quite clear why, for example, <coughs> President Zelensky and other Ukrainian politicians, they always label, name uh, Russian authorities as occupying power, as occupants, even if the formal occupation on particular territory, because of the lack of control, doesn't exist. And uh, those genocide uh, accusations we, uh, appeared on both sides. Yeah? The first was uh, Russia, which uh, accused Ukraine for genocide in Donbass. Um, and also you could uh, find in, the, in YouTube, in, on different social media, that there were even um, different groups, music groups, to ask to register songs about genocide in Donbass, just to mobilize Russian um, yeah, songs. Uh, for example, there was there was a name that uh, um, situation in Donbass, and there are um, the choir of women who are uh, singing about genocide in Donbass. And well, in what to... sense genocide? They said what kind of genocide? They just use the word the genocide. So they use the word genocide. Of course, in the song, he would not have the good explanation. Yeah. But then also the accusation concerning genocide appeared in the official Ukrainian narration that they were accusing that this is Russia which commits a genocide against uh, uh, Ukraine. And at first my reaction was, mm, not really, come on, 
this is exaggeration and uh, I understand why we use it um, on political uh, terms because it helps mobilize public opinion, it triggers different uh, mechanisms in international law and of course um, when you, if you talk about war crimes or crimes against humanity you cannot go to the International Court of Justice based on those conventions which regulate those crimes whether in case of genocide you have special convention from 1948 which could be used to start a proceeding against Russia in, uh, in the International Court of Justice. <coughs> so at first I thought that this is exaggeration and this is the term used more for political purposes but not in its legal um, um, understanding. But then uh, the second thought came that maybe we should be more open-minded and think how, the, how genocide was and is understood in the region having in mind, of course, the letter of Genocide Convention of 1948. As I mentioned, the Ukra Ukraine decided to open the second proceeding against Russia in the International Court of Justice, and you could see that there were two questions which were asked by Ukraine in these proceedings. The first was that the Ukraine asked the uh, International Court of Justice to check whether Russian Federation has falsely claimed that the acts of genocide have occurred in Lugansk and Donetsk Oblast of Ukraine and on the basis recognized the so-called Donetsk People's Republic and Lugansk People's Republic and then declared and implemented a special military operation against Ukraine. So, simple saying, just to check whether really genocide was committed and Russia could start special military operation to stop this genocide. But the second question um, was, um, I think, asked very, in a very smart way because Ukraine also asked to check whether the Russian Federation uh, is planning acts of genocide in Ukraine and uh, that Russia is intentionally killing and inflicting serious injury on members of the Ukrainian nationality. And why I thought that it was very smart to phrase it in this way? Because here, Ukraine didn't ask whether genocide is committed in Ukraine, but they were asking whether acts of genocide are committed. What is the difference? Because, you know, we could, uh, and the, the doubts which are expressed in the literature is that it is very hard to prove that there, was, there is really a special intent on behalf of Russia to commit genocide against Ukrainian nationality. But if you look at the acts of genocide, where there are killings, you know, a transfer of children and so on, maybe Ukraine would like to check whether these acts are committed, but to not check whether the special intent really exists, having in mind the problem of evidence. Um, in these proceedings, we could observe 20, so far 26 interventions, and we expect more of them because 40, uh, over 40 states declared that they would like to intervene. But I would like to also mention that among those 26 states, you have states from Eastern Europe, Central Eastern Europe, which is quite important. It, it is understood as those states should be particularly interested in these proceedings as the war is happening in the region which is particularly important for them. But at the same time, uh, it is important because in this region, they could have some um, its own understanding of genocide as crime. And uh, what is also uh, interesting, uh, that in Polish intervention, because so far we are at the procedural stage of this proceeding, so that's why the interventions which were submitted, they refer uh, so far to the procedural issues that we would like to be considered as intervening party, that we uh, understand that Ukraine could start the proceeding. So they are, you know, they are very, I would say, general, they are not not many merit issues raised there because everybody is waiting for official publication of Ukrainian memorial and counter memorial of Russia. However, in Polish intervention, you could see the references to the Soviet crimes. And one of the crimes which is mentioned there is the question, they say, consequence of the genocide perpetrated on Polish nationals during World War II by Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. 
Yes, so the, the Poland in this one sentence, I, I'm not sure whether they really wisely considered uh, the consequences of this statement, but they, they stressed that there was a genocide against Polish population committed by Nazi Germany and Soviet Union, and then Soviet individuals responsible for the 1940 Katyn massacre, both the direct perpetrators as well as political leaders, and here Joseph Stalin and Lavrent Tiberia are mentioned here. And um, this is not, of course, explained here in the intervention, but in general, Poland was seeking any possibility to raise the issue of Katyn massacre in the relation between Poland and Russia in the court. But all expertise which were submitted to the president, to the government, they were saying, well, we don't have legal tools to do it. Uh, you know, the road in the European Court of Human Rights is closed now and in the International Court of Justice we don't have jurisdiction what is left you know to request for the advisory opinion or for example to intervene in some other proceedings and raise those issues as uh, you know some example and exactly this what was done just to use the proceeding which was started by Ukraine and at the same time remind about cutting crime but this cutting crime could be also of the use for Ukraine because the Polish intention is to show that we could observe very similar policy um, of Russia in comparison to Soviet policy, that we can observe the same pattern. And why it is so important? Because, for example, firstly, if we talk about the context of Ukraine, uh, the Soviet policy of Holodomor would appear. Uh, also, the um, question of um, uh, the Great Purge policy and the action against particular national groups which were considered as enemies of the Soviet Union. Uh, several crimes committed during the Second World War because on one side you had a, um, you had a fight with the Nazis but on the other side, the Soviet Union was thinking about the new order which is supposed to be established after the Second World War. So that's why you had to eliminate those who could uh, threaten this new order which the Soviet Union wanted to establish. And uh, please remember that those, for example, mass deportations of uh, inhabitants from the Baltic states uh, and the persecutions in Baltic states, these were the examples which Baltic states emphasized during the 1948 uh, convention negotiations and this was for example one of the reasons why the Soviet Union opposed uh, to the inclusion of political groups into the definition of genocide and of course we, we should add to this the persecutions during the Cold War period and a certain pattern that it was always like this when the, the Soviet Union was coming to the state the first thing which they were doing they were identifying in uh, the particular groups uh, the political elites the, um, um, uh, also the for example the representatives of the church and they were convinced to cooperate or killed so if, you, so if you remember about this pattern, you can try to compare it with the situation in Ukraine, which we can observe now. Uh, <coughs> okay, um, and now the question which was already raised by Liora, that maybe the genocide which, we, which Ukrainians are talking, maybe Polish people are talking, this was not real, um, genocide like physical destruction of the nation but maybe this was more like a cultural genocide uh, which was uh, on purpose excluded from the 1948 uh, um, definition and in fact when you look at the, um, the original writings of Lenkin, Axis Rule in Occupied Europe you would find uh, his um, statements about the will to annihilate the groups themselves and also when he explains how the genocide is committed, he explains that you have different stages, disintegration of the political and social institutions, of culture, of language, national feelings, religion, economic existence, destruction of personal security, liberty, health, dignity. So you can see you have different stages um, uh, which aim at the annihilation, yeah? but uh, they appear at uh, a different time. And you could see that at the end, he says, genocide has two phases. One, the destruction of the national pattern of the oppressed group, and the other, the imposition of the national pattern of the oppressor. And in the resolution um, from 1946 concerning the genocide, you could see that when there was an explanation why we need the definition of genocide, why we need this new crime, 
it was explained that we, we, we want to protect certain groups because of their cultural value, that because they bring something uh, new to the, to the world culture. So this was the main idea behind the, um, the uh, definition of genocide in, uh, adopted in, uh, well, discussed in 1946. <coughs> However, when the, the negotiations of the Genocide Convention started, um, and um, and we, we talk about these final stages, uh, um, um, you could see that still the question whether we should include cultural genocide or not, it was raised by men, uh, uh, including, for example, the uh, Polish scholar uh, Bramson, who was referring to the policy of Ausrotten, of Bismarck, so, you know, Germanization of Polish population. Um, he was uh, stressing, for example, the, that uh, during the World War II, the, um, uh, such events like the destruction of millions of books. And this was for him the proof that the genocide is committed. So, once again, the question of the fight with the culture. Yeah? Um, but, of, uh, but um, the, for example, the Vavre at Pella, the lawyer school, on the same, I would say, to the same extent like Lemkin, where um, 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 were taking part in the, in the uh, preliminary um, works on the Genocide Convention, they were stressing that we cannot consider genocide um, as the general rule which would deal with all the questions uh, of the protection of minorities. That these are not, genocide is not, you know, a general law of human rights for minorities. That no, genocide, we talk about the situation of uh, destruction, annihilation of particular group not only on the cultural level and it, and this and uh, so we need to be aware that in 1948 when the convention was adopted the cultural genocide uh, this one dimension as the proof of genocide was rejected yeah this was the um, uh, the decision taken on purpose um, but it was not understood in this way in many states and the cultural genocide appeared in, for example, in the statements of Polish courts. And now I'm referring to the, those main proceedings which um, took place in the Special National Tribunal of Poland. When you will see that uh, <coughs> these judgments are extremely important, and uh, Laura would refer to Greiser judgment, but uh, the Greiser and Gerd judgment are important because they, they were announced before the Nuremberg um, verdict. And in, during those trials, uh, Polish court didn't hesitate to talk about genocide and to name what was happening in Poland during World War II as genocide. So, for example, they were talking about the concept of transferring children for the purpose of Germanization, from, to take from fa Polish families and to bring them to Germany to create from them the new German citizens. They, they were mentioning privileges which were assured only to the um, to Germans, to Volkstage, but not those who decided to be um, uh, to be listed on um, on the special list prepared by Germans. They were talk they were always linking this. They were saying biological and cultural destruction. So it was not that they were saying, well, cultural destruction, cult the destruction of culture is sufficient to talk about genocide. They were always combining those two aspects. This cultural genocide was uh, mentioned as a proof that we really talk about genocide, that, they, that this is a proof that the particular group is targeted. They were talking about liquidation of Polish culture, liquidation of Polish political thinking, uh, and even there was an expression when they say physical and spiritual genocide. Uh, and what is also interesting, and I think it's very important when we talk about today's context, they were saying that genocide, this is the attempt on the right of small and medium nations to distinct themselves and to exist. This is particularly important when we talk about the, uh, the, 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 today's conflict, when um, Vladimir Putin and, uh, um, and other members of the government, they deny the right of Ukrainian nation to distinct themselves because they, they deny that the, the Ukrainian nation exists as such, that this is the artificial um, um, entity. Exactly. 
Uh, in those uh, judgments, uh, in Dreiser's judgment, you can fight uh, the statements about fight with religion, with Polish culture, and even with Polish science. And this fight with Polish science is also mentioned as the example of genocide. And they explain that genocide is this is a crime against culture and civilization. Yeah, so it's not that we want to save people because they are people, we want to save those people because they bring with themselves uh, a specific aspect of uh, culture. Um, also, in, not only in Greiser judgment, but also in other uh, judgments, you would find the similar references. For example, in Gert judgment, they mention genocide against Polish and Jewish people. So they make the distinction, mm -hmm. yeah, that, okay, it was without any hesitance that we need to label Holocaust as genocide, but they try to uh, explain that genocide should not be limited only to Holocaust, it could be also committed against Polish people as well as other Slavic um, uh, nations. Uh, and you can see in her judgment, biological and cultural destruction of intrant nations, especially, especially Jewish and Slavic ones. For example, it's um, in Forster judgment, they were mentioning that sometimes the specific uh, social groups are targeted because they were saying genocide is the situation when there is a destruction of the most valuable Polish people. Uh, it sounds terrible, yeah? but this is exactly the citation from the judgment. That they, they, and they mentioned clerk, teachers, officials, persons with high education degrees, civil and political activists, rich persons, and those who manifested before war that they were Polish but, and they were reluctant towards Germans. In the judgment, they say that um, the genocide is the situation when you want to interrupt links with families and for the purpose of the Germanization of national socialists, the uh, Germanization national socialists were taking children to right, and also the general fight with Polishness, of being Polish. Yeah? This is how they explain genocide. And um, I would like to stress that this is not um, uh, in all those judgments, Really, there was a huge excerpt devoted only to the description of the fight with the culture. But this was used to prove that the aim was to destroy the group as such. So this was a helpful tool to prove that genocide was committed. And what kind of comparison we can make? Okay, Germanization, if you talk only about Germanization as some, you know, uh, the impo to, to try to impose your own national patterns, this would not be sufficient. But now we talk about, for example, Russification of different nations of different people. Um, but, um, for example, uh, but, but as this was stressed in the courts, I would not um, resign from um, stressing this uh, policy of Russification to try to prove this aim to eliminate the group as such. When you, for example, check the statements made by uh, Russian politicians, you would find the statements about denazification of Ukraine, or which was been the Ukrainization, yeah, that they, they, uh, they could be encompassed by uh, Greater Russia, that Dmitry Medvedev was talking about elimination of emigration, Ukrainian emigration and independence activists in Russia. Um, Vladimir Putin, who was stressing that Ukraine is artificial construct created by Lenin. These kind of statements could be understood as uh, clear statements that they deny this right of Ukrainian nation to distinct themselves, to exist as separate national group. The fact that, for example, in those territories which are occupied, you have many attacks against Orthodox churches, that the libraries are destroyed, uh, monuments are destroyed, uh, um, that even the, um, uh, the right to exist of Ukrainian language is uh, undermined as artificial language. Um, and there are also attempts in those parts which are occupied to replace the Ukrainian education system with the Russian ones. So you can see that you have, you have different symptoms of the fight with Ukrainian culture as such, and with this, like I said, in those Polish courts uh, judgments, you had Polishness, I would say here, Ukrainianness, yeah, you know, this identity as uh, Ukraine. 
And of course you could uh, find certain arguments presented why we should not label this as genocide. This was presented recently in Journal of International Criminal Justice by William Shabas, who said that we need to remember what words mean, yeah? and we need to stick to, the, um, to this original um, wording which we observe in the 1948 uh, Genocide Convention. And I fully agree that to prove genocide in the court, we need to prove this specific intent, this special intent that the aim is to destroy nation as such. And those few statements which I referred to, maybe they are not sufficient. This is just the first step and you need to um, conduct uh, further research. Uh, also, my colleague from Ukraine, he was stressing that there are also many, um, um, many publications published by Russian um, um, politicians, scholars, in which they undermine the, uh, the Ukrainian identity. Um, but you need to also prove that there was, uh, that from those statements about the lack of Ukrainian identity, we can derive this special intent to destroy Ukrainians as such. Um, uh, and uh, also, um, um, we need to remember that um, when, you, when you want to destroy the nation, as the nation, it doesn't mean that you need to kill everyone. Yeah, that it, it is sufficient to eliminate those two who oppose for example, reciprocation, and if all others would uh, uh, decide to recognize themselves, for example, Germany as Germans, and now, for example, as Russians, this would be sufficient you know, to, to, to claim that the genocide uh, could be committed. One of the arguments which is also raised is that there is a small number of victims. And yes, if you compare to those um, major genocides which we could observe in the history, we can't compare it to Holocaust, we cannot compare it to Rwanda uh, genocide, we could not compare it uh, um, I, you know, to the situation even in case of uh, Yazidi genocide and so on. But I think that we need to also take into account that the number of victims could be much, much, much higher. Yeah? And the fact that, for example, there is humanitarian assistance provided, so that's why people are not starving so much. That people, for example, that you have civil defense which uh, tries, which attempts to protect people from the, um, um, uh, from the results of the hostilities, uh, it limits the number of victims. But it shouldn't be um, understood as uh, some kind of privilege for the aggressor. Yeah? This is, uh, the, the number of victims is lower because with Ukraine and other states, they do what is possible to limit those, uh, this number. And one of argument, and I can understand this argument, uh, uh, that um, William Shabas is mentioning, this is what is happening, it happens in many conflicts, yeah? Civilians are dying. If we talk, for example, if official statistics are saying that over 5,000 people died in this conflict, sorry, but it's not so much in comparison to other armed conflicts. Uh, and that, you know, uh, cities are bombed, uh, cities are destroyed, it happens. Well, perhaps, but at the same time, in um, the I would say that this um, this policy, when the in systematic manner hospitals are destroyed, schools are destroyed, uh, that uh, in systematic manner you have certain cities which are just you know raised to the ground, like for example Mariupol. I think that this is not something normal, which we should accept that it happens all the time. But if you add to those, uh, if you add to this, all those statements and all those uh, proofs of the fight with Ukrainian national identity, this could help to um, to build a case concerning a genocide. So I would like to stress: I am skeptical from the legal point of view to label this what is happening in Ukraine as genocide. However, having in mind that genocide label helps you, for example, to start proceeding in the ICJ or start certain procedures in the United Nations, I wouldn't reject it from the beginning, but I would really consider all those symptoms, having in mind that those references to cultural genocide could be a proof of this special intent to physical destruction of the Ukrainian nation as such, 
And uh, I'm also, one bitter maybe remark, I'm also very surprised that, for example, William Shabasko is proving in his um, articles that we can speak about genocide even if the one person would be killed, <laughs> now he's concerned that only 5,000 Ukrainians were murdered. So this is something which really surprised me in his argumentation. Exactly, this is not about the numbers. Okay, thank you very much.